Hey, guys, today we're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. We go into this powerful account of Lazarus. And what we see in this account of Lazarus, who is called from the tomb forward into life, is uh, we, we see this awakening that takes place for our hearts as we look into this story. It is jam-packed with so many cool little nuggets. It'll probably take us a, a couple Sundays to get through it, knowing, knowing how slow I go through that. So, but I'm excited. It's like this, this, uh, this powerful wake-up call. You know, if, if you realize what's ahead of us with eternity, and you have uh, an understanding of the glory that's ahead for those who have faith, then there's an urgency to living. There's an excitement for whatever journey we have, even the highs and the lows, because we have an expectation of the fact of knowing what God will do in the resurrection, that there'll be life eternal. I remember how it felt uh, when I was a kid uh, in in school here, and my buds and I would would make a plan that we would wake up way early, dawn patrol, and we're going to go to Mammoth, and we're just going to ski our brains out and get back as quick as we could. Uh, Or not get back as quick as we could, leave as early as we could. And I was just the guy that would get in bed, and just stay awake, because I knew the alarm was going to go off at 3 a.m. And I just stay awake the whole night, like, <laughs> we're going skiing tomorrow, you know, just a, just a pumped. Anyone else understand that? Maybe it's Dawn Patrol for surfing or whatever it is. I just was like, oh, just couldn't even wait. And then it, my, my, I would blow my sleep because I was so stoked for what was ahead. May that be the truth for us in our walk with Christ. May we be so stoked about what's ahead that we don't have time for sleep. We gotta live while we live and, and, and accomplish the things God wants for us. Here's what's powerful about this gospel. Uh, John making a great emphasis on, on the deity of Jesus, allowing us, taking time from his perspective to let us know the truth of who Jesus is as the son of God. And he, he goes to great detail to reveal the, the great I am statements that Jesus makes. I am the bread. I am the, 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 the uh, living water. I am uh, the door. I am the, sh- the, sh- the shepherd of the sheep. And uh, so on and so forth. These I am statements of who, what Christ would say of himself that he and the Father were one. That he is the Son of God. He goes to a great level. He also goes to a great level to identify certain miracles. And to kind of focus in on these mir- some of the miracles that Jesus did, seven kind of key ones that he focuses on, so that we, it would be without a shadow of a doubt. We'd be able to see it and go, oh, and wake up and understand life everlasting. He didn't want us to miss these pivotal moments. Well, this final one here in verse 11 is, is, is a, a, the coup de grace. Is that the right word? Coup de grace? I don't, I don't know. Maybe. You know what I mean. It's like the, it's like the, the cherry on top, this fantastic account of Lazarus, who would find himself dead. Four days, stinketh in the tomb, and called forth to life. Kind of a mind-blowing story. But this is what all of the scripture longs to do, is to wake you and I up to believing and to knowing who God is. Tried and true, confident in the scripture's power and the authority and its consistency and, and, uh, and, 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 and just the power for life. Listen to what John would say in this same gospel in, verse, in chapter 20, verse 30. He'd say, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now he's just getting ready to close up that gospel in chapter 21. He closes it all up. But this statement is so powerful. He's saying these things were written for one reason, that you would believe, that you'd come alive and awake to everlasting life, that you'd come literally yourself from death into life everlasting. What's powerful in these portions of Scripture, so, so many different things. You know, the, the Gospel of John is unique in several ways. This Gospel, uh, really, the, it's 21 chapters long, um, but right here at chapter 11, chapter 12, starts basically the Passion Week. Starts when we really focuses in for the last uh, 11 or 12 chapters, 
focusing in on all the details of who Christ is and what he's come to do, his atoning sacrifice, who he is as spotless lamb of God, tried um, and found guiltless and placed upon the cross for the sin of the world, buried, risen from the dead. And he spends so much time because he wants us not to miss a bit of it. Through this gospel, we see Jesus, uh, at least John brings to light these three different accounts where he we see someone who is dead come alive. The first that we encounter in this gospel, or well, that we, that we encounter in Christ's life is this one of this young men who is raised from the dead. In Luke's gospel, chapter seven, verse 14, Luke writes, then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And so he who was dead sat up and began to speak and he presented himself, he presented him to his mother. Another one of the miracles that we remember through the Gospels was when Jesus healed uh, Jairus' daughter. And remember, he was on his way with Jairus to go heal her and, uh, and uh, stopped with the woman that, that had the condition of bleeding. And then the, the, um, the servants of the house come and say, hey, it's, it's no use, she's already dead. And Jesus, I can just imagine, and I don't know that he was holding his hand, but I can just imagine him going, look, do not fear, only believe. And he goes to the home, and in Luke's gospel, chapter 8, verse 54, here's the account. But he put all of the mourners outside and the family outside, and he took her by the hand, and he called, saying, little girl, arise. And her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. Now in this gospel, the gospel of John, chapter 11, we see Lazarus. Lazarus is a little different because by the time we get to the tomb and Jesus gets to the tomb, he'll have been dead four days. The others, we don't know how long, but maybe a day or two in, in, in the process. Jesus went pretty quickly to them uh, in, in light of this. They used to do the ceremonies uh, within the first three days uh, for ritualistic, re- for um, uh, what's it called when you don't want to walk under a ladder? Superstition, yeah, thank you. Hey, when the words leave, I've got a lot of people that will help me and just bring the word back. For superstitious reasons, the Jews believe that the spirit would hover over the body for the first three days, but by the fourth day, the spirit is long gone. This idea of grown, you know, we, we know this is just superstition in regards to what it was, so it's interesting that when we get to Lazarus, it's way past even their superstition. This guy was dead, dead, dead. But what I love is in each one of these accounts, It's Jesus' voice that calls them forth. And what's so powerful to know is today we're looking into the word of God, Jesus, who is the word who became flesh and dwelt among us, and when we read it, we hear the voice of God in our life. The challenge is, are you letting it call you into life? Are you allowing it to accomplish what God longs for it to accomplish, which is rise up, young man. Rise up, little girl. Come forth, Lazarus. Come forth and hear. See, God has healing in his word, hope in his word for all mankind, for eternal life. And I, I just think it's a, it's a powerful thing because each moment we see him using his mouth. It wasn't that he had to do some cool ritualistic thing, you know, when the dirt came out and stuff, and he didn't have anything in that. It was simply his voice alone calling us forth. It's his voice that drew my heart to him in that moment that I realized I wanted to put my faith and belief in Jesus Christ. It was right here in Calvary Chapel, up on Pebble Hill. And I can remember as the pastor said that, just how my heart felt. I almost, I forget the words that he said. All I knew is I heard the voice of my God saying, Tommy, I love you. Come forth and have everlasting life. And I came down to the front and found life everlasting. Now there's a difference between restoration, being restored, and resurrection. And sometimes this gets mixed up a little bit when we're looking through. We think, oh yeah, Lazarus was resurrected. No, no, he was just restored to more suffering. Uh, Each one of them were restored back in to more suffering. It's a difference. The reality is, he's going to die again. (laughs) But the next time he dies, he'll be present with the God of all creation. And then his body will be resurrected on the day of resurrection, which is a powerful, powerful difference. See, Jesus is the first and only who has been resurrected from the dead. He's the first to redeem us and to beat death for us. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 
verse 42. Here was what Paul says. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in, the na- in a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So these people that were called back into life here were called back into this temporary life. It means they'd cry again. They'd suffer again. They'd deal with heartbreak. They'd deal with the highs and lows of living. They'd endure to the place in which God has appointed for them to then draw him to himself. Now when their faith and our faith is in Jesus Christ, we know this, that when this body stops, we're present with the God of all creation. That's how it works. <clears throat> and in the same twinkling of an eye, because God's outside of time and space, I'm not going to get too off on this because this is a rabbit trail, but there will be the resurrection of the dead when Christ receives us to himself. When he comes in the twinkling of an eye, there'll be a rising, the dead first. What? And then those bodies will not have what these bodies do. The suffering of this world. Those resurrected bodies are going to be epic. I mean, just... I mean, I don't even, you can't even get near how cool it is. It's going to be so good. That truth is what brings us into life here because we're here purposefully. This is a short period of time and there is an eternal glory that's ahead and we know that if our faith is in Christ that we will be resurrected at the day of resurrection, at the moment of resurrection. That will will be a a mind-blowing, beautiful thing, an eternal hope for all who believe. Now, let's get into our story because this is where we'll start looking into this account of Lazarus. There's all kinds of beautiful truths in here and I don't want to miss any of them and I love to just pause on a few. So I'm going to read the first uh, couple verses here. He says, now, and if you remember where he is, uh, he has been there uh, at at the uh, Feast of Dedication. Then he has left Jerusalem. It's winter time. He's gone up into Judea. He has left Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem because they're trying to stone him there. They're basically rising up to kill him. So he goes off into the country where he would, he'd be safe in this time. Remember that he's trying to fulfill God's, the Father's perfect timing for when he will be the Lamb of God, crucified there on, um, on, uh, at Passover as the Lamb of God. So he's, he's purposeful in pulling back a bit. And uh, we, we see that it, right during this time, he now gets called back into Jerusalem, which will then begin to uh, be this, or right, right next to, to Bethany, to Jerusalem, and will start the process of him going to the cross. So him leaving this region and coming to this new, back into the region of, uh, where Jerusalem is, is really the start of his sacrifice for all mankind. So it says, now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that, it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. It's a certain man. Now Lazarus, uh, his uh, his Hebrew name, Eleazar, which means God is my help. But here's the thing about these three, these two sisters and this brother, is they were friends of Jesus. They were loved by Jesus. In fact, this would be the place that Jesus would go and he'd find himself staying with them when he was near Jerusalem, coming in for the feast. He'd spend time with them and we know this through several accounts where he is with them. Um, He also, as you know, he'd have his kind of his base camp in Capernaum and obviously he was from Nazareth. So there's some key cities just to remember. But he's here and and, and this is this town of of Bethany which is right outside Jerusalem. It's like two miles. Basically uh, kind of where the the Mount of Olives is and I didn't get a map for you but it's just basically right right there near Jerusalem. And we hear of this, uh, this, this family, these loved ones, And I like the way it's phrased here in the New King James when it's called this certain man there of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. I love that that John makes reference to knowing Bethany as really the town of Mary and Martha. You see, they were known by their gentleness. They, They were known by their character. They were known by the church and by those at that time of of those who were sacrificial before God in service and in worship and in love. And it's interesting that he says this is the town of Mary and her sister Martha. 
Guys, I really believe that believers are meant to change the community they live in. Not by standing up with signs rebuking people's sin and brokenness, but by the gentleness of our character and the faithfulness of our love for Jesus. See, that's contagious in the world. We have had enough of people screaming their opinions left and right wherever you land in that. We've had enough of that from one generation on to another. What the world is longing for is children of God who love in such a manner that it speaks louder than any sign you can make, any proclamation you can make with a bullhorn. It speaks because it's different than what the world has. God longs for our city to be transformed by our character. It's our character. It's our love. You know, we had a moment in uh, Vail that I'll never forget because it was truly a, 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 one, of our, one of our vision statements for our church in Vail was we wanted to be under our city, like a, a net, a safety net, so that when something happened, they would say, well, let's ask that church to see if they'll help us. And there was a moment the, the, the uh, city council was putting several thousand dollars into a haunted house and it was uh, the biggest thing going on in all of Avon and people were going to it and it was candy and crazy scary stuff and all this stuff. And our church decided that we would just do something a little different without any scary things and that we'd love our community and we'd done it faithfully for a time. And one day I got a call from the mayor and the mayor says, uh, you're Pastor Tommy? I said, yes, I'm Pastor Tommy. He goes, well, this is Mayor Wolf. I'm like, well, hello, Mr. Mayor. And he says, you know, I was wondering, what do you think what if we were to stop doing our haunted house and you guys do what you do? And I'm like, well, I'm gonna have to think about it for a while. <laughs> you know, we don't really wanna. <laughs> and he's, before, I even, I, before I even get back and said yes, he said, and we'll give you all the money from the city to do what you do. And I'm also, well, you know that our whole goal is that we share Jesus at this event. And he goes, we, we just love what you do. Would you mind doing that? Yes, sir, click. And we did it for years and years and years. It was fantastic. It was kind of this like, oh, yay. He saw that what we did was different. He, they longed for it. He talked amongst the city council. And, well, let's just have the church do it. They got the volunteers. They got the people, the heart. Let's have them do this thing. What's really wonderful to know is that Mayor Wolf and his wife came to an Easter service 10 years later and came to know Christ, which is pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. But, um, uh, but that's the idea. And here we are, and this church has left an imprint already. You think about the work that has gone over these last, what, 45 years, 48 years, I think it is, as a church we've been, is it right, 48? Rob would know, the, Dave would know, I don't know, something like that, as a church in our town. And you, there's a reputation of that. And may we be faithful to take it to the next level that God would have it by being followers of Christ. Uh, listen to what uh, Paul says here. He says, um, in Philippians 1, verse 27, he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. It's not about our church, it's about the church. It's about us standing as one with the believers that are in all the awesome churches that are in Santa Barbara and that love Jesus and proclaim the gospel and that we would be one. But what would be seen is this faithfulness of conduct to the gospel. Jesus gives us the model of what that looks like. He endured to the cross and laid his life down for the sin of the world to give life to all who would believe. It's, 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 a, it's, it's powerful, and we get to walk worthy of that. 2 Corinthians 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, Paul would say, our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly towards you. You know, it's one of the cool little side notes of getting our kitchen rolling is that we want to be able to serve people and love people. And what's crazy, if you've come on a Wednesday or a Friday afternoon, you'll see all these workers. We're not advertising. It's just word of mouth, and they're coming and sitting. The other day, I was walking by, and I'd just taken some stuff from the table, and I was cruising this way, and the guys, as I was leaving, like, who is that guy? 
And uh, the other guy goes, I think he's the pastor of the church. <laughs> and I came back, I go, no, 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 I'm just the, one of the bus boys here, you know, just picking up some stuff with him. But we get a chance to, in simplicity and sincerity of heart, love. It was so fun, a bunch of them were in line there and I got to buy them lunch that time. And like, you know what, your lunch is on the house. They're like, what is happening to me right now? It's like God's loving you right now. That's what's happening to you. You're getting loved by the king of glory. And so may we, with our conduct, with simplicity and godly sincerity, love, love, love. Now here's what's happening in their home. They were sacrificial. They were worshipers. They were lovers. They served. You remember that dynamic, in fact, John brings it alive, of Mary and Martha. And that was a, that moment where Mary is at his feet and Martha's busy serving. Now some people pick on Mar Martha all the time. Like, oh, Martha was too busy to be where she should be. But she was serving and loving. And yes, in that moment, Jesus used this as an opportunity to say, look, look at the intimacy here. Don't serve so much that you're missing being still. This happens often with our servants in our church. I have to go, hey, guys, it's time to take a break. You take a break and sit at the feet of the king and love him. And she broke the alabaster box and just the, the precious oil on his feet and using her hair. It was just, just a powerful, powerful moment. And John brings it to light to the, to the reader that we remember this town set apart Mary, Martha, Lazarus, this home was filled with love and grace and mercy. They were worshipers, they were sacrificial, they were thoughtful. They were love, 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 love. Verse three, therefore the sisters sent to him saying, remember he said there was a certain man, Lazarus, who was sick. So their sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, him who you love is sick. I just love to underline that. That's a good one when you have COVID, you're like, mm. Him who you love is sick. Just underline that, look at it for a moment, and just, okay, I know, I know this. Our God loves him. Listen to what Spurgeon says. He says, they did not say any more. They felt that it was quite enough to tell him that Lazarus was sick. And they left it to the teacher's, the teacher heart of, I'm sorry. They left it to the tender heart of Jesus to do whatever seemed good in his sight. Some prayers would be all the better if they were shorter. All the better if they did not so much declare our own will as declare our confidence in the good will of Christ. I like the omissions of Martha and Mary's prayer. It's a beautiful thing. Don't we sometimes get frenetic in our anxiety to have God answer our prayers the way we want them prayed, where we want them answered? Lord, and then and this, and then it's got to be like that, and then we do this, and we just want to list it all like he doesn't know the fullness of what's going on. We forget who he is. He is sovereign. He is El Shaddai. He is almighty God. He knows the beginning and the end, and he knows your circumstance. He's all too aware of the sickness or the struggle that you're in. What this does is it gives us a new boldness in our prayer to go, and Lord, you know right where I am. All the details are in your hands, God. Your will be done. Remember, that's how Jesus taught us to pray, right? Is it our Father who art in heaven? Hallowed be your name. There's no other name bigger, right? Your will, be, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You, Lord, you above all, declare our confidence. So what, what happened is, Mary and Martha, they had a very familiar feeling with Jesus. So they knew that sending this message to Jesus was just like, just let him know the one he loves is sick. That's all he needs to know, because we know him. So you see, there's something so outstanding about knowing you belong to Jesus and having spent time with him. You know, and we, we do what we can as a, as a family to remind you to read and do an abide or come to the special things that are happening. David, Pastor David Guzik has a cool thing coming up, dive deeper and abiding in the word of God. We, we can tell you these things, but really it's between you and God whether you will say, I wanna know you. <laughs> I wanna know you. I want to know who you are. Why do you love me? I'm worthless. Don't you see? I can't control my mouth. I can't, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a weasel. Help me. But he knows, you know, when you know him, you know that he loves you and knows you and there's a confidence that comes in it. They had a feeling of belonging because they'd spent time with Jesus. She held his feet. Oh, can you imagine? <laughs> That's just such a radical thought. And may we be holding his feet and, and just near to his heart. Think, think about the anxieties that will leave. Think about the depression that will flee knowing he loves you enough to die for you. 
knowing it because you've spent time holding his feet, being with him. You know, we've gone into home group season and um, you know what happens is a beautiful thing that God wants for the body of Christ is that we would know and be known. That we would know one another and be known by each other in the same way as we know our God. And so when you get to be in a home with a home group, you, you learn where people are at and you hear the dynamics of, of suffering and victory and hope and the word of God in the middle of it and there's a strengthening because Jesus meets us in the middle of it. Just like we do on Sunday morning, same way. We're, we're, we're gonna meet in and we're gonna press into the heart of Jesus but home groups gives us a time of really belonging and understanding belonging to each other and those friendships are, are key. Um, Jesus had said this in his prayer in John's gospel. We'll get to it in chapter 17 when Jesus is praying to the Father But he said, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And you know I I reference this often because I think it's such a powerful prayer of the Messiah before the Father. Say, I just want them to be one, just knit and in us and us in them. And then the whole purpose of that is so that the world may see and know that I came to die for them. Our goal of serving, our goal of gathering, our goal of loving our king is to exalt him, bless him with simplicity of heart and the world will take notice because they'll say, I need that love. I want that kind of tender mercy in my heart and my life. I need that forgiveness and that hope that, that those who are in Christ have. Verse four of our text. So they don't throw up a big long prayer uh, all over the place. They just say, let him know. <laughs> Jesus, just let him know the one he loves is sick. In verse four, Jesus heard, uh, heard that and he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. What a great statement. This sickness, this place that Lazarus is in has grander purposes than anyone knows. It wasn't that God made Lazarus sick in that moment. That, that's not the case. Sometimes people go, Did God, is God just making people sick? And No, but you understand we live in a fallen world. The condition of our bodies is that we're degrading and, and decomposing <laughs> in the moment we come in. We're not, anybody getting younger? Besides, I see a couple that are getting younger, but we're not, you know? We've had to put our bed on the floor for our dog because he's had hip surgery. And uh, so our bed's typically high. <laughs> I don't know how you get out of a bed that's on the floor. (laughs) I got out of it the first morning. I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. So we're not getting younger, okay? Things things hurt in a new way, a new thing. but, 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 But the reality is, is that God wants to work through this journey that we have to the to our our to our final destination, which is heaven. And there will be, there is suffering. There is. And we know where we go. All of us, these bodies will die. But we have a hope in heaven because our God has redeemed us and will raise us from the dead the last day. So he says, this sickness is not unto death, but the glory of God. I'm gonna be glorified in it. You and I have a choice every time we run into a pit or a broken place or some valley or some struggle or some circumstance. We have an opportunity to allow God to bring glory in it and through it. Sometimes we do it gracefully, other times we don't. I I, I certainly gave a good whine when I first got COVID. I can't smell anymore, oh, help me. (laughs) We all all have our moments in it, but the goal is the quicker we can kinda become alert to know and let God finish his work. And if the work of sickness is unto death, then I know I'll be present with my king. And there's a hope in it. It removes the anxiety. It doesn't mean we won't have some, or, you know, we, you know, there's not a perfect man or woman on planet Earth, but, but we will have that hope because we've spent time with the one we know loves us. Psalm 23, verse four, this portion of the shepherd's psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They're, they're, you're with me. I know you. I've had my hands on your feet. I know where you'll take me. So give me the strength that you might be glorified. God has a plan in this. 
Verse, verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Every time we see Jesus looking upon the suffering, there's compassion. Even when the droves of thousands were gathering and they were hungry, he had looked upon them and there was compassion. He looked upon them and he was willing to heal. He looked upon them and he was willing to surrender. When he looked upon mankind, he was willing to come and be a sacrifice for our sin. God is love. That's how we know what love is, that Christ has given his life for us and, and, and who he is. He is loving. Jesus loves and he looks. You know, it's a beautiful thing to be loved actively all the time by El Shaddai, God Almighty, the God who sees, who's providential, who's sovereign. He is the king of all creation and he loves consistently. Even when you've fallen, and if you've fallen this week, or you've had a struggle somehow this week, you've, you know, oh I, went, oh, I wish I hadn't done that stuff. God's love is faithful. Usually, we spend far too much time beating ourselves up, and a little beating up is okay to go, ah, oh, what have I done? That's fine. That happens. Then, Lord God, let me not walk there again. Father, forgive me and heal me and help me and strengthen me so I can walk in a new way with you. Colossians 3 verse 12 says this about who you are. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on mercies and kindness and humility and meekness and long-suffering. But, but the elect of God, he's drawn you to himself. You are holy not because you somehow are good enough or I somehow am good enough. I'm holy because of Jesus Christ who has redeemed me and I'm beloved like crazy. You're beloved like crazy all the time. So when we know him, we're near to him, and we know of his love, we can trust him through the valley. Verse six, we now begin to see a change in dynamic of where Jesus is as he's in a safe location where there's no persecution, well, no persecution per se. Verse six, so when he heard that he was sick, this is Jesus, hearing Lazarus, Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let's go to Judea again. Then, uh, I'm sorry, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? And remember every time John uses the word Jews in this phrase, he's not just simply talking about Jewish people, he's identifying those religious leaders, the Jews or the Pharisees that would be, um, that were trying to ultimately put him to death. So he hears of this truth, and he hears about it, and then he hangs out for a couple days. And this bothers people. This was like, wait, 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 wait. If he loved him, it's like, he's sick, gotta go. I mean, you say that to Brett, Brett is at the hospital visiting you. You say that to Ray, he's at, at the hospital. He doesn't go, okay, maybe one of these days I'll get by and see you. That's not what, what they do, they run. And so in this situation with Jesus then pausing, remember that every bit of Christ's steps in obedience to the Father was Timing and providential work to bring him to the cross as the prophetic truths had been uttered he would. When he would die, how it would, all of it. It's just, it's mind-blowing. So in obedience to the Father and also for the glory of the circumstance. He's waiting long enough that all the superstition of, well, you know what, he did bring him back, but the Spirit was still hovering, waiting to come back for an opportunity in those three days. No, he's going to go four days and stinketh, already decomposing. And I'm, not trying to make fun of, well, it is, it's an interesting, uh, it's a fun one to teach, because <laughs> he, he stinketh is just a fun thing to say. Um, we say that of our dog all the time, oh, he stinketh. <laughs> God's timing and purpose is above ours. It, it, it's, it's, um, people have thought, well, it must not have been important that time, it was absolutely important. In fact, we see it in the fact that he paused long enough to fulfill everything that would bring the greatest glory. Isaiah 55, 9 says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And God, hearing God say that, he's reminding us in just the gray matter that we have, we understand this way. Well, do, 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 do. and some of you have really fantastic gray matter and you can think of a lot of crazy things and yet God is so much farther than your skull. He's above all and in all and through all and over all. He is almighty and he loves you. 
And when you know him, there's a confidence and a peace of your eternal hope. When you've asked him for forgiveness, there's a confidence in the midst of the trial. And so his plan is being fulfilled. The disciples were concerned about Jesus' safety. They're like, wait, 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 why are we going down so soon? You know, if, you, you know why are we going this soon? Verse 9. Jesus answered and said, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, this is a marvelous statement that is true all the way down. When you can see, it's easy to walk. Lights are on, you're not stubbing your toe on, on dog toys when you, through the house. That's just how that works. And, and in this world, we know from the Proverbs and Psalms, this idea of God lighting our path so that we can see. And if we're walking around at nighttime, there's brokenness. But, but Jesus here is making reference to his sovereign plan, his beautiful providential plan. He's talking about the 12 hours of light that we have are markers of kind of his life and his journey to the moment where there will be no more Jesus with them. He'll be buried and risen and ascended to the Father. And so he's making this statement, kind of he's saying, look at I have the confidence that the Father is working out his complete and perfect plan. They say, you can't go in there. Don't, don't, don't go in because this is not the time. He goes, oh, I have confidence. In fact, I must fulfill what the Father has set before me. He was purposeful. It's what, what he came to do. In fact, in John's Gospel, chapter 9, Jesus himself said, I, verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. This statement, because he sees the light of the world, I want to just give you two verses on this. Psalm 27, 1, he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength and my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Isaiah 9, verse 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus is that great light. Those who dwelt in the shadow of death, actually, he's making reference to John the Baptist bringing light in Jesus himself. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So John goes before Jesus and says that light. Jesus comes and is the light among men. I am the light of the world. It, it, it's, it's a mind-blowing, beautiful picture. Jesus wants us to know that he came purposefully to light this world up so that all would have an opportunity to have everlasting life, to know him completely. What it does for me is it's a great reminder that God knows my day. He knows your day. And Psalm 139 says that he, every day that were, uh, all the days that were fashioned for us were written in his book. I messed that scripture up. You have to look at it. It's in Psalm 139. But he talks about the days that are fashioned for us already, God has known. He's got a plan. That means right now, I'm in the 12 hours, I'm in the 12 hour stretch. I don't know whether tomorrow is nighttime or not. I just know that I'm to do what God has asked me to do with this time he's given me. And that just gets me fired up. I was so stirred up in reading this portion of scripture and being reminded of this truth that not only was Jesus fulfilling that, but that God has a purpose and a plan for each of us. In Ephesians 2.10, he says, for you're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He wants you. He needs you. The body of Christ needs you. The church would love to have you come at time. I love that throughout the week, we have some folks that come in and like fluff all the pillows, clean all the pads, wipe down the benches, just do random love, take the scuffs off the wall, cruise into the kids' area and sanitize stuff. All these things are happening, not because we asked anyone to do it. They've come because they are got 12 hours in the day, Better accomplish what God has for us, which is to care for his people, care for the church, care for those that are outside. So guys, today, the time is urgent. It's time to wake up from slumber and walk according to God's beautiful plan. God has set us right here in this city <clears throat> for this time for his glory. It's pretty concerning when we look, <clears throat> excuse me, when we begin to see dynamically what ha- was happening with you know, political things in the world and even this the dynamic of, of, of social struggles that are happening around us, it's pretty easy to get discouraged and go, yep, 
city's just worthless. You know, it's like, oh, the, 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 the state is worthless. People fleeing it all the time. Our nation, you know, all these things are not worth the time because it's just broken. It's going this way or arguing about it. It is difficult. But God has work for us. And he wants us to love genuinely with simplicity, with passion and hope of the kingdom of heaven so that we could transform the work around us. We have a work to do. God set us apart for it. Verse 11. These things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I might wake him up. Now, the disciples, in verse 12, it says, the disciples said, well, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe, nevertheless, let us go to him. It's interesting that Jesus there says, I'm glad we weren't there. (laughs) Can you imagine hearing that? Lazarus is sick. No, he's actually dead. I'm glad we're not there. Who are you? I thought you were going to be loving. You know, it kind of sounds kind of intense. But here's the shepherd of our soul saying, oh, wait till you see what I have in store for you. It is good. And the completion of this story will show it as we call him forth and we realize who is the author and who is the great resurrection of all mankind. It's Jesus. Will you stand with me this morning? I want to read one more scripture to you as we stand before the king. Romans chapter 6, verse 9. It says, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Maybe you felt the Father drawing you to himself, revealing his love for you. If that's the case, don't waste any time. It's time to give your heart and be called from death to life this morning. And so will you close your eyes with me, bow your heads, and if this morning you know God is calling you to himself, will you raise your hand above your head? Amen. Or I hi, just hi, here I am. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. And I'm going to pray for those whose hands have gone up. And for all of us, so we pray along with you this. Pray in your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are drawing me to yourself today. I ask God for your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, I pray you'd wash me clean with your sacrifice and fill me up with your Holy Spirit and make me your own. I want to enter, leave death and enter into life in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Oh, amen. Good job, guys. Good job. And so, Lord, as we close with this worship, we want to be known for worship. God, we want to be known by our character of lovers of the Most High. So meet us as we finish our service in love. Meet us as we pray with one another. We love you. Love you, Jesus. In your precious name, amen.